Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is a companion video. What are companion videos? Well, I'm often glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take your live comments and questions. However, we usually don't have enough time to get around to all the live comments and questions that get sent in, but I want to make sure you guys don't have to wait too long to get those answered. So what I do is we gather them up and we address the unanswered ones here on companion videos. So we've got a few to get caught up on here, so let's get right to it. We're going to start things off here with Kawhi Leonard, who writes, or Kawhi Leonard is a scroll writes after watching the f9 trailer being a fan of the franchise and all the ridiculousness that has happened in it the one thing that i'm finally calling bullshit on is that i'll never buy that john cena and vin diesel are related i don't think they're even the same race okay fair enough and true but remember they they could be half brothers Right, they could have the same father and a different mother they could have a uh, whatever so they're 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 uh, Kid, kid work. No, listen, I'm not going to lie. The first time I saw it, I was like, really? I'm supposed to believe that they're related. But, you know, different mother, different father. It could it could happen. They could be, you know, half or adopted brothers. I mean, they could say that too. So we'll have to see. Well, let's give F9 the benefit of the doubt for now. All right. Um, Guillaume LeBel writes, Hey, John and Rob, I watched the Mitchells versus the Machines. Uh, so many people are writing in about this. I got to watch this tonight. Uh, Mitchell versus the Machines on Netflix last weekend and absolutely loved it. It's hilarious, charming, and touching. Another big win for Lord Miller. Also, rewatched Scott Pilgrim versus the World. That movie aged gracefully. I love Scott Pilgrim versus the World. I love that. Now, um, the I was really lucky at one of the parties that I threw at Comic-Con a bunch of years ago, the year that Scott Pilgrim came out, uh, Edgar Wright and the entire cast of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World came to our party. We awarded uh, Edgar Wright with an award that night. I got to hang out with Brandon Routh and the cast of the movie, and it was a great night, and I love the movie. But again, Mitchells vs. the Machines, we talked about this on the show today. I still haven't watched it. I was going to watch it last night, and then we remembered that there was a new episode in Nevers that we still had to catch up on. So we watch that instead, but I keep hearing great things about Mitchell's versus the machines. I'm going to watch that tonight. Tonight, I'm finally going to get caught up on that. Uh, thanks for the reminder about that. All right, next up, Jesse writes, the other day, someone mentioned how, uh, how did Andy Dufresne put the poster back up on his wall? This is from Shawshank Redemption. I assume the poster was only hung from the top like a curtain so he could lift it up and would just fall back down looking like a normal poster. I mean, I'll have to go back and take a look at that specifically to see how they, they do that. But I mean, again, I'm sure if he planned for like 20 years to do what he did to get out. I'm sure he probably had a plan for that, but maybe that's true. Maybe it was just hanging there gracefully. We'll have to go back and take a look at that. It's a good point, Jesse. It's a good point. All right, next up, Jay Wentz writes, Hey, John, I know a lot of folks get excited about a Jordan Peele-directed movie, but I gotta say, he may be an even better producer. The credits under his name, Black Klansman, Hunters, Twilight Zone, Lovecraft Country, or, uh, uh, Country, uh, The Last OG, and Candyman Thoughts. Well, I mean, listen, it all depends on what he actually did on any of those movies. The term producer is a very nebulous term when it comes to movies. Uh, uh, you can get a producer's credit for working on a movie 20 hours a day for three years, uh, coordinating everything that goes on. You're the one who secured the rights to the screenplay. You're the one who, wh whatever, coordinated everything. You hired the director. You made sure they had everything they needed. But, like, literally, Steven Spielberg has gotten producer credits on a couple of movies for literally making a phone call. Or, you know what? I know this actor you want. I can arrange for a meeting between you and the actor, and I can recommend the actor take the role. But if they do, I want to get a producer's credit, whether it's an associate. Like, so I'm not saying, I'm not trying to undersell what Jordan Peele has done as a producer. I'm simply saying it's just hard when you don't really know what did, did he do want. Did he really have like input? And was he really one of the creative forces behind making those things happen? Or was it something like some of Spielberg's things? It's hard to say just because the term is so nebulous, but Hey, listen, either way, the dude is having an incredible career. All right. Next up, uh, star Bucky Barnes writes, what's the first ride you want to ride and thing you want to eat when you get back to Disneyland? That's easy. I'm a big Disney park nerd. I can't wait to ride haunted mansion again and eat a churro. Uh, do you have a favorite memory at Disneyland? I wish I lived in Cali. Like Ann and I, yeah, we have, we don't have an annual pass anymore because they got rid of annual passes, but Ann and I have had annual passes to Disneyland for 
six years, seven years. I can't remember how long. Anyway, my favorite um, ride at Disneyland, easy, 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 is the Indiana Jones ride. That That is, I have to do it every time we go to Disneyland. I got to ride the Indiana Jones ride. So that is easily going to be the first thing that I do when I go back. Um, so yeah, there's that. The um, My favorite food at Disneyland is actually a particular dish in one of the restaurants there. I think the name of the restaurant is Blue Bayou. I think that's the name of the restaurant. Anyway, they have a uh, Monte Cristo sandwich that is to die for. Like seriously, whenever we go there, it's a little expensive of a place to eat. But whenever we go to Disneyland, I got to have that Monte Cristo sandwich. And, and I never have Monte Cristo sandwiches anywhere else, anytime ever. But in that restaurant, that dish is unbelievable. So that's what I'm doing first. All right, next up. Uh, Eddie Burton writes, uh, curious in your opinion of Josh Trank. He had a great hit with Chronicle, blamed studio interference for why Fantastic Four was uh, w- went south, and then said he had full control over the Capone, over Capone, and that film turned out awful. Uh, is he a one-hit wonder and a crybaby, or is there talent there? No, there's definitely talent there. When you go back and look at Chronicle, that movie was all direction. I mean, it was all direction. Uh, I thought he did an incredible job, especially with a Hollywood trope like the found footage movie was so overdone at that point. Like, it's been a while since we've had the the found footage, but a lot of people forget when Chronicle came out, we were all sick of the found footage trope, right? He found a way to do use that sort of found footage trope and make a absolutely compelling, compelling story. And it was just so well done. I was so blown away by it. I love that movie. With Fantastic Four, listen, that is very well documented, what went on there. I mean, it, they literally, uh, half the things they greenlit and said, yep, they, he pitched them his vision of it. He showed them the outlines, the storyboards, they greenlit everything, and then they changed their mind. Like he's making his movie like, well, we don't want you to do that now. Now we want you to do this and blah, blah, blah. And they literally took the film away from him. They changed a ton of stuff in the movie. They threw him out of the edit room. And at the end of the day, it just wasn't even his movie anymore. I, and so, yeah, like I usually will go, look, it's a studio's movie. They can do what they want. But the thing is, when you meet with a filmmaker and you green light all the things they say they want to do, well, then at that point, you now got to let them just go and do their thing. Like, I I don't mind studio interference because it's their movie and it's a collaborative art, so that's fine. But this was like one of those circumstances where this was completely the studio's fault. Now, the Capone movie, I didn't think was all that bad, to be honest with you, but it wasn't all that good either. But to me, he's one in one, right? So Fantastic Four, we take that off the board altogether because that wasn't even his movie by the time it was done. I thought, uh, you know, Capone is probably a bit of a loss. Chronicle is an incredible win. But with all the drama surrounding him, it's going to be very, very tough for him to get that, uh, to get more actual studio pictures done. I hope he does because I think he's got a lot of talent. But who knows? We'll have to see where things go. All right, next up. An anonymous viewer writes, Hey, John, regarding Andrew Garfield denying involvement in No Way Home, uh, Tatiana Maslany, Paul Rudd, and Brie Larson all denied being cast in the MCU before being announced uh, as being cast uh, cast shortly thereafter. So why would we trust Andrew Garfield? Okay, so, uh, number one, Paul Rudd did not deny it. After he had officially signed on to the movie, Paul Rudd did not deny it. The Tatiana Maslany thing is never actually happened. This has been, this has been being brought up a lot. What it was, it was a totally misreported thing. Like everything you saw, all the news sites that were reported, we talked about it on my show when it first happened. They're all quoting this tiny little local newspaper from Canada, some small little northern Ontario town um, that nobody in the world reads. They completely just wrote it wrong and it came across a certain way and then everybody else around the world ran with it. So the Tatiana Maslany thing, ignore that. Just completely ignore that. The one that I think about, uh, about denials is, you know, when J.J. Abrams said, oh, no, no, Benda Cumberbatch is not playing Khan Union Singh. No, he's not playing Khan Union Singh, not at all. And we all knew he totally was. And of course he was. But here's the thing. This is what we call the argument of exception. All right. 
you just e- even if you know even if and by the way i don't think brie larson ever came out and made a big public denial after she was a, she was cast in the role i don't think she ever made a big public denial about it either but anyway even if you want to say all three of these things happened that's three out of what a hundred thousand so it's like it's like saying oh this one in a million thing happened see that must be happening all the time right it's called the argument of exception and it's it's never a good idea to to you know stand on an argument of exception you know 90 999 times out of 100 when an actor says they're not in something they're not so it is most safe to assume that that's the truth maybe one out of every 100 hell maybe one out of every 1000 times that an actor says they're not in something they actually are so it's possible it's possible i said myself on the show today listen i still think it's possible but um, it's not, you, you got to understand you're not in a good place in your argument. If your argument is based on the argument of exception, you know, well, there's this one in a billion time. Therefore we should just assume that one in a billion time always happens. No, it doesn't. It's very, very rare. So, well, I mean, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Like I said, I still think there is a chance, but at the same time, if Andrew Garfield is saying he's not okay, he's not. But it could be that. But we're saying, so why should we trust Andrew Garfield? Well, because 999 times out of 1,000, they're usually telling the truth. So I say we assume Andrew Garfield's telling the truth until we find out he's not, which is still possible. But yeah, this whole thing of, yeah, out of the 10,000 times actors have denied that they're in a role and they're not, there's one or two or three times that they've denied it and they actually are. Well, that's not a good argument. So always try, and that doesn't just apply to Hollywood and and our discussions about movies. If you ever find yourself making an argument of exception, stop, reevaluate your position and reevaluate your argument. Again, once in a blue moon, it'll happen, but it's not a good thing to rely on. That's just my take on it at any rate. All right, next up, the sock rights. Damn, Mark got his shit folded. I've never seen a hero take an ass whooping like that in a one-on-one and be that one-sided. Uh, took it on the chin, though, and his eye, cheek, and everywhere else. Yeah, he got, yeah, well, well of course, right? Like, remember, Omni-Man said, we're talking about the show Invincible. Uh, that's what he's talking about. Mark is invincible. So it's been explained that um, that their race, they get stronger as they get older. Mark is still totally young, which means he's as weak as he's ever going to be. Whereas his dad, Omni-Man, is, I don't know, a thousand years old. How I can't forget how old they said he was. So he's significantly more powerful than Mark. And yes, that was a savage ass beating that Mark took. No doubt about it. Right. Peter Cunnington writes, with Ms. Marvel coming out, I think I saw Paul Sung Hung Lee in one of the trailers. Maybe he plays the dad and with Simu Liu in Shang-Chi. They would both be in the MCU. Maybe they would show up in a movie together at some point. And how cool would that be? Well, I mean, we're talking about Kim's convenience here. I love everything about Kim's convenience. I'm super excited about that. And of course, Paul showed up in Mandalorian, which is great. However, no, I don't think you saw him in one of the trailers. Uh, As far as I know, there is nothing. Now, Paul is in the Disney family because he's in Mandalorian, but there is nothing. uh, I don't believe there's been anything about Paul being in the MCU at all, though. But having Simu Liu from Kim's convenience in Shang-Chi and having Paul show up in there too would be amazing. I love that dude, but no, as of right now, I, I don't think that's the case and I don't think that's happening. All right, next up, uh, Zed Habjoka writes, Hey John, Marvel gave us the title for the next Black Panther movie and it's Wakanda Forever, which we talked about on our show yesterday. And it got me thinking on what could the plot be? Are we headed towards having multiple Black Panthers uh, presented in a way that would honor the main Black Panther? Thanks. Well, I mean, I don't really know that there's anything to be gleaned from the title Wakanda Forever. I mean, Wakanda Forever is, of course the big tagline that everybody says about Wakanda, Wakanda forever, right? That's, that's been said a lot. So I don't know that it actually gives us any hint or any indication about what, um, the movie might actually be about. Do I think we'll get multiple black Panthers? It's possible. I'm going to guess no, because again, if you look at the history with the way they describe the history of black Panther in Wakanda, it's always just been one. They've never, I, as far as the MCU goes, the way they've described it so far, there's always just one at a time. 
So, no, I don't think so, but it's a possibility. It's something they could do. Just because they haven't done it before doesn't mean they can't do it moving forward. So it's possible, but my guess right now is no. As far as what will the story be, and, and who knows? Uh, no idea. It literally could be about anything. Uh, and I don't think that the title gives anything away. All I know is that as long as Ryan Coogler's directing it, I'm there for it, and I can't wait to see what he does with it. Still wish they recast T'Challa. I think that would have been the better thing to do. Everybody knows that I think that. But regardless, it's Ryan Coogler, it's Kevin Feige. I'm there. I'm there. Let's see what they do with it. All right, next up. Uh, Zaid also writes, Hey, John, I think Andrew Garfield is bluffing. Could be. Uh, he denies being in No Way Home, uh, but whenever mentions being in the Multiverse of Madness, uh, could this happen? But never mentions being in the Multiverse of Madness. Could this happen? Thanks. And keep the filthy. Okay, so what you're wondering is, okay, maybe he's not in Spider-Man No Way Home. But what if he is in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness? I see where you're going with that. Kevin Feige has mentioned that WandaVision, Spider-Man 3, Spider-Man No Way Home, and Doctor Strange 2 are, are kind of have a story arc going on there. So what if? He's not, okay, he's telling the truth. He's not coming back to play Spider-Man or a version of Spider-Man in No Way Home. Okay, he's telling the truth. But what's actually happening is he's going to be in Multiverse of Madness. I got to say, it's not something I've considered and it's probably not the case, but that would work because, you know, with all the rumors about him being Spider-Man again and then him denying being in No Way Home, well, what if both are true? What if he is Spider-Man again, but not in No Way Home? It's an interesting proposition. I, I don't think so. But I'm fascinated by the possibilities. I'm gonna keep my I'm gonna keep my eye open on that. That's a really good thing to bring up, man. All right, next up, Daryl Best Wadley writes, "Hey John, uh, f what the polls say. Uh, put your show at the time slot you want. If it's easier for you, we're all gonna watch anyway." P.S. Uh, I'm a 12 p.m. supporter, so I'm biased. It's actually cool that you listen to your fans. So of course, what Daryl is talking about is. You know, I experimented for a week of starting, you know, the John Campus show is live. We do it live Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Los Angeles time. That's 1 p.m. East Coast time. And what we did was we experimented doing it for a week at 12 noon Los Angeles time or 3 p.m. East Coast time. And I will admit it works a little better for me doing it at noon. It changes the entire way my day becomes structured in such a way that makes my life a little bit easier. Not not like massively easier, but makes my life a bit easier. <clears throat> However, we did put up a poll and we asked everybody after about a week of doing it that way, do you guys prefer, you know, the 10 a.m. start time or the 12 p.m. start time? And almost triple, more than double, significantly more than double of the respondents say they prefer the 10 a.m. start time. Now, if it was a night and day difference for me, I would have kept it at 12. But you know what? Um, the show is about is more than just about me. It's also about our community. And the community spoke. And I want to honor that. I mean, they honor me by watching the show. So I want to honor that. And so we moved it back to 10. And, and like, I'm not saying we're going to keep it at 10 a.m. forever. But for now, we'll keep it here. And it, and it works. And it's fine. But I, I appreciate, Daryl, the vote of confidence, man. I appreciate the support on that. All right, next up. Uh, we've got Mason, who writes... Hey, John and Rob. Obviously, Rob's not here right now. Uh, we're now less than five months before Venom 2 is supposed to hit theaters, yet we haven't seen so much as a picture regarding the film. Do you think Sony will push the movie again, or will we be seeing a lot of Venom in the next few months? Uh, again, listen, Venom, let me just double check the what is supposed to be the actual Venom uh, Venom uh, 2 release date. Let me just double check what the actual date is supposed to be again. Okay. So September 24th, we're in May, June, July, August, September. So almost five months, almost five months. I listen, we just saw Morbius just got moved again, but if I'm not mistaken, it only got moved by a week. So no big deal. Honestly, five months out. I, I don't think, I don't think we should even worry about the trailers right now. Like if we get to three months out, Okay, so let's say we get to the end of what, what would it be June, July, August, September. Yeah, if we get to the end of June, so we're just at the beginning of May right now. So let's get another month and a half, almost two months from now. If almost two months from now, we still haven't seen anything, then I will start to wonder maybe if they, they might be budging it again. But again, I normally don't give it a second thought until we're only three months out. 
There's no need to put out trailers right now. What's the point? Any buzz and hype that gets generated by a trailer coming out right now is just going to dissipate over the next few months. And any buzz and hype you would get from a trailer right now, you'll get it if you wait till it's a little bit closer to Venom. So I don't see the need to put it out this early. Let's give it another couple of months. But again, if we get like into July, if we get like mid-July and we still haven't seen any promotion, even at that point, I'll start going, hmm. I wonder if they're going to push it again. But for right now, I don't think there's anything for us to worry about. All right. At least for now. At least for now. All right. Next up. Uh, Suthius writes, with the post credit scene of Without Remorse clearly setting up another movie that's Rainbow, uh, do you think we'll actually get another movie? Did Amazon plan for multiple movies in this franchise with Michael B. Jordan? Critical rating is not good. No, it's not a good movie. I mean, it's all subjective. You may have watched it and you may have enjoyed it. And that's awesome. I love it when people enjoy the movies they watch. I'm just jealous because I wish I could have. It's a bad movie. I was so excited for it. I was so pumped for Without Remorse. I love Michael B. Jordan. And the movie's just not any good. Uh, But clearly, clearly, they did this with the plan of it being a franchise. You don't do that post credit scene. What are you going to call it? I'm going to call it Rainbow. Woo, he said Rainbow. We all know Rainbow Six, Uh, right? So they clearly, that's the plan. But I just hope if they do it, they make it a hell of a lot better than this one because this one was a mess. Just bad, terrible dialogue, bad story, massive plot holes. Um, Yeah, just not not a good movie. But I do believe that the plan was to do many. Let's see if they rethink it. But if they move forward, just please, dear God, do a better one than this one. All right, next up, Isaac Meckler writes, I finally did it, John. I watched Game of Thrones. It took me about two weeks. Woo! You watched all of it in about two weeks? Not bad. It took me about two weeks, and I loved it. I went into the final season with very low expectations, so I actually enjoyed it a bit. Uh, Really excited to see House of the Dragon. Listen, I'll tell you what. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if it's the unpopular thing. The last season of Game of Thrones was awesome. It was awesome. It won, I think, more Emmy Awards than any show in history. I think uh, it, in one single year, it like swept all the awards and all that kind of stuff. And I know there are a lot of people who are really butt hurt. Oh, they made Danny bad. I was saying for years Danny was going bad. Nobody believed me. I kept saying for years on my show, believe it, Danny is a jerk. Danny is going to go south real fast. She's going bad. They're making it obvious she's bad. They're making it obvious she's going to go dark. They're making all of this obvious that she's deep down a massive, massive jerk. And everybody said I was crazy. Everybody said I didn't know what I was talking about. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's right there. They are making it clear as day she is going bad. She is bad. She's just got this veneer on top of it. But she is rotten to the core. They're making it obvious. Nobody paid attention. And then she went bad, like I was saying for years that she would. And we went, well, that came out of nowhere. No, no, you were just in denial for years when other people like me, and believe me, I've been wrong about a whole hell of a lot. So let me celebrate when I'm right about these years long predictions. But when there were people like me who were telling you for years, look, they're making obvious. And if somebody as blind as me can see that it was coming, you should have seen it was coming too. But whatever. Um, My one big complaint about not just the final season of Game of Thrones, but the final two seasons was, there was no reason to make the seasons that short. While I'd still think the final season, the final two seasons were great, they definitely would have benefited and been be better if they'd given more room to breathe. There was no reason to make those seasons as short as they were. No reason. Benioff and Weiss were, HBO greenlit them making it longer. Make the series longer. They're like, no, we want to get on get on to doing our other stuff. And that was unfortunate. That, I think, left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, understandably. It rubbed me the wrong way, too. But I still thought, I, I, don't, I don't care if I'm in the minority. The minority is not the right. The right is the right. The correct is the correct. And I'm correct. It's all subjective. It's all subjective. But I'm glad you liked it. I liked it, too. And you and I can stand proudly in the minority, my friend. All right, next up. Ryan Loner writes, My major reaction to Thunder Force, for the love of God, can somebody please get Ben Falcone a hobby? Yeah, so listen, and I always feel bad about that. For those of you who know, we're talking about the new Melissa McCarthy movie that, once again, her husband, Ben Falcone, directed. Every Melissa McCarthy movie that Ben Falcone, her husband, directed has been dog shit awful. And I always feel bad saying that because, well, I've never met 
Ben Falcone myself. I've never met him. I know several people who have. Um, and everything I have ever heard about this dude is nothing but awesome. I've never heard anything but amazing things about him. I hear he's a great dude, a great husband, a loving man. I've heard nothing but good things about this man. And so I always feel bad, but that's just my job. My job is to give commentary on movies and the movies he has directed and nobody else will let him direct a movie and other than, you know, his wife strong arming them into letting her husband direct. He it's ter he's terrible. He's a terrible director. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's just a bad fit. Like maybe him doing Melissa McCarthy movies is just a bad fit. Maybe he'd be much better if he was directing Ryan Gosling or if he was directing Octavia Spencer in a, in a standalone thing without Melissa McCarthy or if he was directing Emma Stone or what, I don't know. Maybe it's just a bad fit and he'd actually be a great director if he wasn't doing Melissa McCarthy movies. But yeah, I, and Thunder Force is just lit. It's iconically awful. Like sometimes we speak in hyperbole and we say, oh, that movie was terrible. Well, I mean, maybe it wasn't terrible. It's just, it was just bad, right? Thunder Force is a legendarily bad movie. It's just horrible. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, it would look, I gotta say though, it would be interesting at the very least interesting to see a movie he directed that was not with Melissa McCarthy. I mean, Melissa's not the problem. Clearly she's got, she's fantastic, but Every time they do a movie together, it just turns out to be absolutely awful. Anyway, uh, next up, uh, an anonymous viewer writes, Hey, John, I've been watching a lot of classic films lately from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. While there are lots more modern movies that I love, there is a certain charm to that older black and white movies uh, that, that older movies have that I don't see much anymore. Uh, some of my... Uh, where are we? Oh, uh, it looks like that... Unless he is, oh, ba uh, probably Baldy is next. Okay. Some of my favorites are Double Indemnity. We I remember a couple of years ago, we did this big thing on Double Indemnity. I, I really do love Double Indemnity. Gaslight and The Thin Man. I don't think I've seen The Thin Man. I don't think I've seen the film, The, the Thin Man. Uh, anyway, uh, do you have any favorites from this era? Oh, talking about that era. Uh, I mean, I never walk around with lists off the top of my head. So oh, hold on, let me let me just let me just check. Okay, yes. Yeah, so Weathering Heights is obviously one that you totally have to go with. Also, I often forget about it, but that was the era of uh, Errol Flynn, right? So like Captain Blood, Robin Hood, those ones, the original King Kong from that era as well. So yeah, there are a bunch, but listen, this, there's something really cool about going, you don't even have to go as far back as the thirties, but like even like into the fifties and stuff like that, you get to see, there's something really amazing as a movie fan, when you get to see where did movies come from? And you see the evolution of the art and you see the things, what's really magical is when you identify and recognize the things that are the way they do movies, then that they still do today, how differently and how similarly they tell stories at the time. So it's always a good exercise, man. So good on you for that. All right. Next up, we've got Muhammad who writes, Hey John, I just want to so show my support and appreciation for your hard work. Thank you so much, man. Uh, directly from the, the Middle East. What do you think about Warner Brothers dropping a Justice League 4K uh, trailer? Timing? Is it necessary? The video already has 100,000 dislikes. Really? Why? Well, I mean, because everybody who hates on it, you know, you, this, you literally have this organized mob campaign to, you know, downvote Kong Kong versus Godzilla, to, you know, try to boycott Mortal Kombat, to do whatever the things unless they get what they want, right? So you get, whenever you get these big organized movements like that, that they get what they want. They get their headline, they get their spotlight, all that kind of stuff, whatever. Listen, that they made money with that movie. They wanted to highlight it. I don't care. I mean, I, I don't know why anybody's talking about it. It's a movie that came out like what, four or five years ago. I mean, who cares, but we see this stuff all the time where a movie puts out a remaster of this, that, or the other thing. So I don't know why like people try to make an issue out of it to me. It's not an issue. So eh, whatever it, it's not really worth talking about it that they even did it. And it's certainly not worth talking about the people's response to it. So that's my kind of take on it. At any rate, next up, Carlos Hernandez writes, 
Uh, Loki comes out on a Wednesday instead of Fridays. Yes, we talked about that this morning. Why? Because times work different in the TVA, that the Time Variance Authority. No, seriously. Why do you think they changed the day? Is it because of bad... <laughs> No, they don't give a shit about Bad Batch. No. Um, is Disney going to premiere another show on Fridays? Honestly, don't know. I mean, I don't really think that it matters. Like, we talked about that on the show earlier today. First of all, let's... No, it was not because of Bad Batch. About one one tenth of the people that are going to watch Loki will probably be watching Bad Batch. So that, that's not something they care about at all. Not to mention, this is all video on demand. This isn't like the olden days when if you had cheers on at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, any other network putting a, a show up at 8 p.m. on Tuesday was going to get killed, right? But this isn't those days. We live in the video on demand era. Disney could literally put out Mandalorian season three, Moon Knight, uh, whatever, the, the Obi-Wan show, and they could all come out on the same day and it wouldn't affect anything at all because it's all video on demand. You can watch it whenever you want. You can watch it right as soon as the second it drops. You can watch it two hours after it drops. You can watch it three days after it drops. It doesn't matter. And so, no, the the Bad Batch thing, which is laughable, uh, no, uh, that's, that's, that's not it at all. Ultimately, why? Don't know. Probably some studies that show viewing habits over certain days and whatever. One of the things that I suspect... This is one of the things that I suspect is it has to do with traffic load. How many times have we gone to watch a new episode of Mandalorian or WandaVision or Falcon and the Winter Soldier and gone in the first five minutes after it drops and have like the Disney Plus site crashing? and the app not working, and having to wait for like 20 or 30 minutes to get in. So even when it's working, you know that their server load from traffic must be really huge. So my best guess right now, I'm going to write to somebody over at Disney and see if I'm right about this. I, I don't know that I am. I might be dead wrong. But my guess is this, is that I bet when you analyze the analytics that the you know, the server loads and the, and the traffic loads are probably heaviest on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. That's probably when their, their server loads are the heaviest. My guess is that by moving Loki to Wednesday, they know not as many people will flood at midnight or ha be, have to watch it the first day because that's not when the, their main server loads are. So it'll lighten the loads. It'll spread out that main influx of viewership over a couple of days instead of over just 24 hours. And that will just be easier on their systems. It'll save them a lot of energy. It'll save them a lot of hassle. It might just work better. Again, nobody has told me this. This is just my guess. My guess is it dropping on a Friday, which is the peak streaming hours, you know, for Friday and Saturday. That's probably when something like Disney Plus gets its most usage. Moving that premiere to Wednesday might even it out over a longer period of time. So, uh, again, I haven't heard a better theory, but I have no idea if my theory is right or not. But that right now is my best guess as to why. And, you know, listen. It really doesn't matter what day they drop it. I, I, I kind of like the idea of everything being the same day. You know, Mandalorian airs Fridays, Friday at midnight or Thursday night at midnight, Friday morning at midnight, whatever you want to call it. But Mandalorian airs on Fridays. WandaVision aired on Fridays. Falcon Winter Soldier aired on Friday. I mean, it's just kind of nice knowing that that's always the pattern. But I have a feeling if this works out for them, that Wednesdays will become that new pattern. And again, my guess is it's for a technical reason. I, I think it's probably because of traffic and server load. But maybe I'm completely wrong about that. Nobody has suggested that. That's just my guess. Good question, though. All right. Next up, uh, let's see, we got Caleb writes, and this will be our last question of the day, guys. Uh, Caleb writes, uh, trivia, uh, while there are many Hollywood dynasties, there is only one director who directed both one of his parents and one of his children to Academy Awards. They were both actors. Who is this director? Ooh. Okay, so let me think about this for a second. Give, give me a moment. Uh, uh, they directed their own child to an Academy Award and they directed their parent to an Academy Award. So, okay, so I'm thinking of like the Reiners, like, uh, like Carl Reiner, maybe. Um, 
Okay, you know what? I'm I'm gonna pause the recording for a second, and I'm I I don't know, but then I don't know what the third generation is. Uh, I don't think Ben Stiller ever directed his dad to winning an Academy Award. All right, you know what? I'm gonna pause for a second. I'm gonna look at that's a great trivia question. I'm gonna go look up the answer. All right, so it's John Huston. I didn't even think like John Huston obviously directed uh, Angelica Huston to her Academy Award and Princey's Honor, but I didn't realize his father Walter was an actor. I didn't know about that. That is a terrific piece of trivia and one I am going to keep in mind moving forward. Well done. Great trivia question, Caleb. I appreciated that. All right, guys, listen. That'll do it for my time right now for this companion video. Don't worry, we're going to pick... There's still a couple more. We're going to pick up on the rest of them on tomorrow's John Campus Show. Come back and join us for that. But for now, guys, that'll do it for this companion video. And my picture just went out. That's okay. Uh, anyway, guys, thanks again for being here. Special thanks to all you guys who sent the questions. Number one, because you give us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved here at the John Campus Show, thank you guys for that support. That'll do it for me for now, guys. My name's John Campion. And until next time... Now go to the graphic.